Bitcoin price action has been quite static recently. That may be the calm before the storm. According to Glassnode analysts, on-chain metrics are signaling that a major price move is imminent. Now the main questions are, in what direction will this move go and how should you prepare for it? To find out, we looked at on-chain data with Glassnode analyst James Check. Before we start, as always, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel. Also, turn on the notification bell to keep up to date on our next videos. I'm Giovanni. On this show, we challenge the ideas that shape the world of crypto. In each episode, we assess a crypto narrative, a macroeconomic outlook, or a potentially disruptive technology. Only the most solid ideas will make it to the other side. In a recent report, you pointed out that uh, we are living through uh, a period of uh, relative calm in, the, in, the, in, in terms of price action. So Bitcoin has been trading within a quite tight range uh, with very low levels of volatility and very low levels of volume, which is uh, quite rare. You point out that it, it's usually a sign that a big price move is coming up soon. So what does it make you think so exactly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's kind of a, a, the nature of markets. We generally see uh, range expansion, range contraction. So the market likes to move, um, consolidate in a certain price range. And what happens is you reach a point when sellers of all, all sorts, people who are taking profits, people who are taking losses, basically everybody comes to terms with the current price range. And, uh, you know, this plays out in technical analysis and on-chain analysis where you see this kind of compression um, and we've seen it across a lot of things. We've seen price trading within a very, very narrow band. Um, trading volume is down quite significantly. This is a structural trend as well. This is not just a, uh, a local phenomenon. We've had kind of a multi-year decline since 2021 uh, of trade volumes. Uh, and we see that in on-chain volumes as well. Just the sheer amount of coins that are transacting um, are getting fewer and fewer. So it's, uh, it's really getting to the, the, the sucking out of all the liquidity. Price is compressing. And uh, very rarely does Bitcoin sit still like this for very long. Um, it usually precedes a regime of higher volatility. Traders have, have essentially, uh, you know, price is consolidated. Traders have bought and sold. And uh, the next move, whatever the volatility is going to be, in whichever direction, that's going to be the new incentive for investors to basically take a new position and, uh, and move from where we currently are. You basically said that whether this price movement is going to go up or, or down depends on the short-term holders. So why why is it that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so at Glassnode, we've got two, a heuristic called long-term and short-term holders. Um, and the reason we use this is that there's a, a, a threshold of about five months. And uh, once a coin has been in an investor's wallet for that period of time, it's statistically much less likely to be spent. So we put them in the long-term holder bucket, the hodler bucket, however we want to describe it. Um, now, if we look at hodler supply, um, we've got many metrics, coins older than one year, older than two year, three year, five year. They are all pushing up to new all time highs. So we're basically seeing that the hodlers are not doing anything. They're just sitting tight and their spending is extremely low. So the other side of the equation is the short term holders and not quite, but um, the, the actual threshold for that kind of band um, more or less is 2023. because We're coming up on, uh, on five months now. And uh, so essentially the short-term holders encompasses everybody who acquired their coins in 2023 onwards, which for the most part has now been an uptrend. So what we're basically seeing is that the long-term holders are not doing much. So that means that the short-term holders are going to be the primary driving factor. Um, and where we sit at the moment is an interesting dynamic where um, we look at their cost basis, what's the average price at which all these people acquired their coins. We're currently sitting on it, 26,500, I think last I checked. Um, and generally speaking, that is a, it's a psychological level of support across the whole market. People are kind of sitting at their cost basis. They're not in profit or loss. They're not spending um, at any significant margin. So if we get another rally higher, it could be a, it, it'll create a greater incentive for people to take additional profits. Right, we're up seventy percent on the year. Um, if there's another rally, that could get up to one hundred percent. You get an incentive. Likewise, there's a bunch of those people who bought their coins over the course of the last two months and are currently underwater. So there's already a group of these people who have bought their coins and they're kind of sitting there going, I'm actually underwater on my coins. And uh, if we get a sell off from here, there may be that panic. So generally speaking, they're going to be the cohort that kind of accelerates the move in whichever direction it goes. I also had a look at uh, one of the Glassnode co-founders. He said that uh, he's predicting a 35 uh, 
a thousand for Bitcoin in the midterm. I think that he means in the summer, in the course of the summer, basically predicts, uh, he's pretty confident that uh, a rally to 35,000 is uh, on the cards. What's your take on that? Is it too optimistic? Yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting price level because um, there's a couple of models that sit up there. So um, you'll often hear people talk about the realized price, um, which is basically the average price of all coins that have moved in the supply. Um, now, my team has been doing some work studying because is it really fair that we look at Satoshi's coins, which are holding extraordinary profits um, and all the lost miners and all the rest of it? So we've been doing some work to analyze what happens if you remove those lost coins. And the reason why we're doing that is because those lost coins are going to mask. If you've got a, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of profit, that's never going to get spent. You're going to hide the hundred billion dollars of losses that people who bought in the previous cycle are holding. So we've been done doing a couple of models to try and isolate kind of the economically active investors. What is their cost basis and removing all those lost coins. And interestingly enough, the level that we kind of find when we start extracting that is up there around that 32, I think it's about 32,000, that kind of realm. So my my instinct tells me that's kind of where the true, the true cost basis is sitting. It's where kind of the mean reversion level would be. Um, so a rally to that level, to be honest, wouldn't surprise me. Um, however, what I'm, I'm also conscious of is that when you come up to people's cost basis, right, they've just weathered a 2022 bear market. Um, there's a lot of people out there who are just waiting to get their money back, right? Just, just, Get me out of this Bitcoin thing. I don't want to deal with this, this bear market anymore. Um, so that uncertainty is something that we still have to work through. So um, very similar to 2019, um, similar to 2016, there was like a 12-month period in both of those instances, which was kind of a long-term sideways chop, a reaccumulation period. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if that kind of 32 level um, was somewhere around kind of the middle point of that, midpoint, or maybe towards the ceiling of that level. Um, so certainly there's, there's a lot of models that would indicate price wants to go up there, but I can also see that that's an area where you'd start getting more resistance. People who are up there and kind of waiting for their money to come back, give me whatever exit liquidity I can. Um, I suspect there'll be a, a lot of resistance as we get through that point. I hear very often this comparison with 2019, like as the 2023 point where we are now can be compared to the point we were in 2019 in terms of cycle price cycles, market cycles. And um, what I, I was listening to an analyst who was making the point that in 2019, we had half a year, which was basically in, in the red and uh, half a year in the green. So the first part of the year was, was quite bullish. Then the, the next half was, was bearish, it went down. And then we recovered only, um, only 2020 when we had the, the start of the, of the bull run. But um, so do you think that there is a chance that this cyclicality is going to play out again in, in 2023, the, the year right before the year of the halving? Yeah, um, I think it'll be similar but different. Um, so I think that 2019, kind of looking for that, we call it an echo bubble. We kind of get like a, a second miniature bubble. There everyone goes, oh, look, the bull market's back. And then it uh, turns out that you've still got a year of bear market ahead of you. Um, the interesting thing about 2019 is there was a, a huge spot bid, um, which was driven by the plus token Ponzi in, uh, in China. So um, this was kind of this unknown. We didn't know about this at the time. So price is rallying and, and you know, went from 4,000 to 14,000 in, I think it was about three months or four months. Um, and we didn't know this until um, very late in the cycle, um, that there was actually this kind of tremendous spot bid that wasn't being accounted for. Um, now, where we currently sit, to be honest, if I was going to give more of where I think it's going to look like, I actually think something closer to a 2016 is closer to what I expect. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. The first one is that we don't have that kind of insane spot bid. There's not kind of like a discrete thing that's causing that bid just yet. And certainly, I'm very cautious because transaction volumes are very low. And transaction volumes, exchange inflows, exchange outflows, they're all cyclically low. And that's a good proxy for demand in my book. Um, so I'm not yet seeing kind of like this enormous inrush of buy side volume. But what I am seeing is that the people who are still here, right, the people who survived the bear market and still believe in Bitcoin, um, they are still very much active. So it's kind of that dollar cost average just slowly chipping away at it. Um, and the other thing to note is that leverage is extremely low right now. We've seen futures markets deleverage significantly. 
a lot more open interest has moved across to the options space, which is generally more contained market. Um, it's less so, um, you know, options will tend to just expire, uh, expire worthless. They're less so kind of futures that will drive massive deleveraging events. Um, so we've seen a deleveraging and we've also seen following FTX a preference for spot. So people have been pulling coins off exchanges by and large. Um, kind of, you know, they've seen FTX go down and they just don't want that to happen to them again. So we're in this regime where it's more spot driven in my view. And uh, I think that's probably more likely to resemble the 2016 style um, than it is to do a, a 2019 style. Another respected analyst, uh, Michael McGlone from Bloomberg, who is focused on macro, is quite bearish towards the upcoming price action for Bitcoin. Basically, he's saying that liquidity is still being pulled out from the market. Uh, he says that the macro doesn't look good, that we're going to probably not have a soft landing in the US. And so the whole macro environment that he describes is not good for risk on assets. And Bitcoin is still very much a risk on asset. So for the midterm, he's still pretty bearish on Bitcoin. What, what's your uh, take on, on, on his opinion? No, I, to be honest, I think it's actually a very sane take. And, uh, you know, the funny thing about the current market regime is anybody that knows where price is going to go is just dead wrong because some of the smartest investors in the world are saying the same message, which is that this is the hardest market they have ever seen to predict what's going on. And you'll find very credible analysts saying that the markets are going to all-time highs, stock markets and everything else. Um, and you'll find other very credible analysts saying that, uh, you know, it's, it, it's seriously dark out there. I think really it's the time for people to be nimble. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, that's why you look at on-chain data so, uh, you know, so discreetly is that it tells me what investors are doing with respect to Bitcoin. And as you mentioned, um, Bitcoin's kind of one of these indicators of liquidity. We see it the first and fastest fire alarm to respond when things start to happen. So in many ways, you should actually start seeing these things playing out. Bitcoin's kind of like the index. If liquidity starts getting pulled out because the you know the, the U.S. government's got to refill the uh, the Treasury General account, the Bitcoin's going to feel that, and it's probably going to feel it first. And you'll start seeing that reaction playing out in uh, in Bitcoin investors' behavior. So um, no, I, I think it's a very sane perspective. Um, it's certainly something that I've got um, on my eye on as well. Um, so I'm certainly not uh, blindly bullish. I'm uh, I'm actually quite cautious. Um, certainly in the short term, um, over the next couple of months. But again, we see these cycles play out. Who knows? We could equally go to all-time high. It's it's a crazy world out there. Let's see how it plays out, how this trend plays out. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot, James, for coming on our show. It was, as always, a very interesting conversation. A pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me on. Cheers.